Welcome to the Whole Enchilada, a community of high achievers that fight the status quo, rebel against mediocrity, and make life happen. Let's go. Hey, Enchilada Nation, really excited to have you back with us today, and I'm really excited about our guest. This is our topic today is going to be talking about something that is really intriguing to me. A lot of you know that I've done a lot of things in the real estate space, um, and we're going to be talking about short-term rentals, which is something that I haven't personally done a, a lot of, and it's something I'm digging into a little bit more right now to, to increase and diversify my portfolio. And so I brought in an expert uh, today, uh, Flip Zweig, uh, out of Arizona. He and I have done a couple deals together in the past, uh, and uh, his history is like mine, a couple decades in the real estate space and has done a lot of different things, really involved in flipping, wholesaling, um, creative financing, and now has really shifted his focus to the short-term rental opportunity and, and has a great system to share with us today. Uh, Flip, thanks for being on the show today. Marcus, yeah, thanks for having me. I'm excited to uh, talk shop here today with you. Yeah, it's going to be good. What Before we jump into our topic, what else should our, our group know about you? Well, let's see. I came out to Arizona State to go to college. I came from a very small town in the Midwest. And so when I came out at 18, I was like shocked, <laughs> overwhelmed, like because it was so large and being from a town of like 15,000. So it was <laughs> definitely a grown, growing up experience. I learned self-sufficiency and I had always been like close to the parents back at home and they did a lot for me. So Getting out there on your own, Marcus, really shifts your reality. So oh. that was a life changer. And just to be in Arizona, um, I love hiking. I love work exercise. We, we have a great, uh, great weather climate out here, except for obviously in the summer months are tough, but we travel in the summer now. We're able to do that. So, you know, I'm, I'm blessed to be in a great state and uh, have two two kids now that are teenagers, two dogs, and uh, yeah, that's really why I got into real estate early on was because I knew I wanted kids and wanted to volunteer and coach and do all that fun stuff. That's awesome. Well, I, I love the impact you're having on, on the industry and the community, and and I'm, I'm the same way. Like Arizona is just I've I've been a lot of places and uh, lived in Arizona for several years. It has, I have such a love for for Arizona as a state. It is such a cool place. It makes me wonder how many people are just like you came to Arizona for something and it's like, why am I leaving? This is, this is great. I'm staying here. <laughs> this is like, um, yeah. And it just became home. And now my parents are out here close to me. So, cool. um, you know, the Midwest winters are, are probably like, Utah. <laughs> they're, yeah. they're cold and there's a lot of snow to push, but, uh, you know, it's great being out here. And like you said, Arizona is, great for a lot of reasons, but what I noticed, we have so many amazing teachers that come out of Arizona in the real estate investment space. And a lot of those guys like yourself, I came up with in the business and, you know, we were just trying to get our feet wet, get in, in the industry. And now we're, we're still, we survived. Yeah. Yeah. And if you, if it's interesting for a lot of our listeners across the country that also play in the real estate space, whether as a profession or investing, if it, almost anything creative you see in the, in the real estate space, um, probably started in Arizona. It is a hotbed for these new ideas and in our economy and in our industry shifting, <laughs> it's almost like a test market of uh, for people to try stuff. Yeah. The idea really cool. that come from people that focus on programs and, and systems, I, you know, looking back, I wish I would have had something to be mentored that way because there's so many different ways now that we can learn and be mentored by experts. Yeah, yeah. And you've become one of those experts in the industry of, of you're still getting mentored, but uh, the number of people that, that we get a mentor into the next generation is, is exciting. That's that's really one of my passions and, and, and always having mentors too, right? I'm sure you have mentors in your life to this day and I always want to elevate like um, you talk about. So that's that's important. Awesome. Well, uh, I'm really excited about uh, talking about um, this shift you did a couple years ago. Um, in fact, uh, Flip and I were talking a little bit earlier uh, before we started recording, and we've 
when when Flip was really doing a lot of wholesales and, and getting stuff on the market, is I actually I think I bought several of your properties. I'm pretty uh, sure you did, and we <laughs> never met that, like face to face. Yeah, done like emails and uh, yeah. You know, it's it's good yeah. to finally see you after all these eight years <laughs> or whatever it was. I, I got a lot more gray hair now than when when I was buying those properties from you. But it'd be interesting for me to go back and actually look up which properties I bought to see if they're still in my portfolio or not. I know, I know. So <laughs> I saved all, like I have all my files from like early two thousand. That's what I want to do one day. Just spend you know <laughs> probably a week going through all the memories because those yeah. you know you got your highs, your lows. I mean, oh yeah, lost this and. Yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, it is fun. So what what caused you? Because I know you were were really doing really good and successful in the in the flip arena, the wholesale arena. What was the mind shift, mindset shift for you to say, hey, you know what? I need to I need to shift and start understanding the game of the short term rental game. OK, so when I got into um, investment real estate, Marcus, I was looking for freedom. So not really financial but the financial freedom has come with that um, yep. but more freedom of time so my, one of my first mentors he taught me um long-term holds and then shortly thereafter i wanted to flip a house my, myself and like back then they're like is that legal can you do that so <laughs> the first one i i made under a thousand bucks i but i was so happy that i was taking action i got in the game um i ordered uh, Carlton Sheets. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he oh, has yeah. infomercials. And I was cleaning out the garage the other night. I saw the big DVD in there. So, <laughs> you know, that um, experience and loved it, loved every minute of it. But, um, you know, creating your own schedule so you could coach, volunteer. So I was very present always with my kids and pick them up from the bus. Go there. So that, that was the real reason I wanted to find something to do that I could focus on and be available a lot for the kids when they're young. So doing that and then the financial things came, but what I noticed is as I, I did more flips, I had the systems all in place. So we were flipping. So 2005, I met um, a mentor who really elevated my personal life, everything like spiritually. So it was a blessing and he's in his late eighties now, but um, so met him in 2005 and we worked together till the, you know, the financial collapse, but like I learned a ton from, from Jerry. And so the mentorship, but the thing was like you, so I got, I got, I got really sick in like four, four years ago. So guess what? If Flip is sick, like everything, you know, my dad and, you know, a few people around me tried to run it, but like it, it's, it's different. So I'm like, man, this, and then I got healthy again and um, was having lunch with Sasha, who's a luxury realtor in Arizona, who I taught, it comes full circle guys. So I taught Sasha how to do wholesaling. I think it was about 2006. I met him and he came to a meetup or something and um, he was interested. So I taught him how I wholesaled at that time. And he, he did it for about a year and then he transitioned to um, get, you know, full-time realtor and he does extremely well, but um, 10 years, right around that time of his transition from wholesale to become a full-time realtor, he bought his first VRBO in um, Quebec, Canada. So he's a Canadian. So a lot of Canadians had come out here and, and they saved me. I'll tell you the story about 2008, 2009, what happened to Canadians. But so anyway, we were having lunch um, December 2019 down in central Phoenix. And at this point, he's crushing VRBO. He's got him in Palm Springs. He's got him all over. And I, I saw him recently and he's buying like, he's doing like three a month right now. So he he's extremely successful at that. And so he's like, I got this townhouse off 44th street and uh, 202, which is by our Phoenix Sky Harbor airport. He's like, you want to go see it after lunch? I'm about to list it. I'm like, okay. 
So I went to see it. And the interesting thing, Marcus, is it was a retail buy. And he's like, it's 185,000 flip, two bedroom, two bath, um, fully furnished. All He's like, it's been a Airbnb. That's a caveat. It's been an Airbnb for eight years. And I'm like, okay. And he's like, you're going to have to pay retail. I'm like, dang, I don't know. Because you know how our market <laughs> we're always buying wholesale. And I'm like, okay, let me run my numbers. Cause, and then he, he sent me the spreadsheet on what they were grossing um, and netting, you know, every year. Because they had been in this property for eight years as a yeah. uh, short-term rental. I was like, wow, I'll take it. So basically, uh, that was December 2019. We closed like mid-January. And then... Two weeks later, in February, I had my first guest. I like put in a, I bought a brand new couch. Everything else was there. I put in brand new couch. Um, put it, he showed me how to enter all the data on the uh, app. And we, we, we were mentored by him. So my daughter and myself would go to his office and sit with him on Saturday. She actually enjoyed it because... She's a science and math girl, and she never liked my fix and flip stuff. But when she heard about hospitality, VR, like Airbnb, she's like, I want to go down. So she went to these meetings and learned it. She was actually my first customer service person, uh, Marcus, uh, at 17. Wow. And like, we had so many five-star reviews and, you know, and so I'm like, wow, this really works. And the couple was getting divorced, a uh, doctor and his wife, they had six more. I'm like, we'll take them. But then the pandemic struck, right? This was in March. We were supposed to close like the rest, six of them. And I'm like, what do I do? <laughs> so, so we both agreed that we would just cancel the de transaction. And then looking back, I should have just went full force, but you know, there was uncertainty and life and everything yeah. so did that my first one was still extremely busy guys because i don't know you know where everyone's from but arizona is one of the fifth there's five states that have a shortage in medical staffing uh nurses doctors so arizona is one of those states where we're very short on nurses so what happened is we were getting a lot of traveling nurses mm. during the pandemic a lot of, you know, people, and that place was book solid. And man, I, the numbers were just like, how do they do that? Like that, that place is 1100 square feet to it's top and bottom. But like, if I try to rent that uh, on a long term, you, I mean, you do long term. So like, yeah, it, the numbers. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's, that's, that's crazy. So that was your, that was your first one. And that was in, remind me what year that was. That, you got that, that. was 2020, February, 2020. Um, I closed that one. And like I said, we closed it in January, my grandma's birthday. And then February, we had our first guest. So like two weeks later. Yeah, cool. I, I love that. And then it's almost like if you buy the right one, particularly one that's been uh, used as an Airbnb before, it's almost like instant cash flow. So like I, the, I'm looking at some in Florida right now. Um, and it's interesting to look at the ones that are fully furnished, have been used as rentals before versus the ones that are like someone lived in or long-term rentals. It's like, there's a lot more work into getting those ones ready. 100%. Yeah. So our last one was in Mesa and I don't know if any of you viewers have seen Borders houses, but like <laughs> this home was from, it was built in like the seventies and I'd say everything was still in there from the seventies. The mom had passed away. So her son was like 40 in his forties and there was two bedrooms, but there was no beds. It was stacked with boxes and he was sleeping on the couch, but that home that took like 50,000 in reno. So that's what I always say. If it's your first one, you know, it's much easier to get something that's already furnished or at least already renovated. Right. So I did buy some last year that were fully renovated and we just threw the decor in there. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, what, what I did though, Marcus, after I saw that the numbers were actually, you know, 
because I, I wanted to prove it that the number, like what I was hearing from Sasha. And so I, um, as people's leases expired, I would give them their notice and then go in and see what it needs as far as work. And then we, we clean them up, renovate, renovate them, whatever, paint, carpet, whatever. I don't do carpet, but paint, flooring. And then we turn those into a uh, short term. And even like off Glendale and 43rd Avenue, I have a few and they, you know, it's, a, it's more of a blue collar neighborhood, but people from the Midwest came and they booked those things solid in the winter. Interesting. I was going to ask you too, kind of along those lines, uh, like what, what are your specific criteria? I'm, I'm a very, um, I, I run everything by rules. I talk about money rules a lot, investment rules. Like what, what criteria or rules have you created your, for yourself around these as far as like locations, sizes? Great, Great question. So as you know, um, we're always evolving. So you got two types of people. You got someone that will analyze everything, figure out, figure out what they want to do and then jump in. Or you got someone that ju jumps in and then figures it out. I'm more <laughs> to jump in and figure yeah. out what the best business model is. So we're always like evolving. Um, you know, for people watching, I would say one of the biggest tips I would recommend is get something fairly close to where you live because there's enough stress and pressure of learning something new. So if you have something 10, 15 miles down the road, you got to run back and forth. It's a lot easier to set up. Um, I also say like, um, I do like townhomes and condos um, and, you know, back in 2010, 12, I, I wasn't buying those, but then after the financial collapse, I got more into those. So I like those because we don't have to do any reno on the exterior. If there's reno, it's, you know, a thousand square feet, 1200. I, I at least buy two, bed, two beds. Um, so yeah, the townhomes condos is, it's a great, that was my first one. It was a townhome and you know, there's just less reno on those types of projects. And so those are in my criteria um, as far as location, man, I I go right now, I'm in the west side of, uh, of Arizona. So I, I just got one surprise. I'm going to like, um, I got another one in Glendale. We arbitrage coming up. Um, so that's another topic we could speak on as you know, the arbitrage system. So um, yeah, and, and that's what I work with with the students. We really figure out what's their target. Like, so we, we break down, you know, the buy box we're looking for because you, as a new investor, someone that's just trying to learn this game, the more criteria, the more specific, the more easier it's gonna to be to find it. So you really gotta laser in and focus on what your personal criteria is, your, your, your numbers. And so there's a lot of steps in between, but that's kind of a big picture. Yeah. Yeah. Cause one of the things I always look at is, is the, is understanding like who is the consumer and if for the consumer to say yes to this, what are they saying no to? Right. And, 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 and for my, and I'm interested to get your take on this as my mind's working around this is uh, okay. The consumer is someone coming to visit uh, Arizona. If for them to say yes to choosing an Airbnb, they're saying no to a hotel or staying with family. Right. So then it's saying from, from a cost perspective, what are they, what are they getting in the Airbnb that they wouldn't get at a hotel um, and in comparison in price, right? So then you start looking at it and say, okay, well, most people that come to Arizona uh, probably want a hotel with a pool. So are you looking and saying, okay, well, I better provide a house with a pool or a condominium or a townhouse project that has access to a pool? Are you thinking like through stuff like that? Um, great question. So for me, acquisition is more, was more important early in the beginning. So I just want to get, you know, a certain number of them start pulling in the money. And then, um, cause a lot of people always ask me about the pool aspect. The pool is a great amenity, but not all my homes have pools. So yeah. I own, for example, I own one in South Chandler, which is now rated one of the safest uh, cities in America. This education's great there. So what we have there, Marcus, is um, it's a three bedroom, two bath, 1600 square foot property. I bought in 2004, uh, brand new. 
um, no backyard, no pool, but the community is gated. It's got walking trails, it's got ponds, it's got ducks. That thing stays busy all year, even in the summer, because right now we have a family in there that um, their home was, they sold their home. And we've had a number of families since we launched that one in 2020. Um, they sold their home, their other home that they were building wasn't ready. So now where are they gonna stay? They don't wanna yeah. stay in a hotel with the kids for three months. So they book ours and those people are solid, solid guests. Yeah, and, with no uh, turnover for three months is pretty awesome. Yeah, so right now I just got to, uh, and that's the other thing with the platforms, VRBO, Airbnb, you're not chasing money. So the money, like just, they directly deposit it into your bank account every, so say this person, they stayed 87 days. So basically, that 87 days was almost $16,000 to me. So, you know, 87. So let's take that. They, they broke it down to like $5,300 a month that Airbnb pays me, but the guest pays up front because they take it direct from the guest. But if it's over the 28 days, they, they just pay you every 28 or 30 days that, that portion. But you know, that property in particular was only getting $1,600 a month rented. Um, the family destroyed it because I never checked because mm. I was getting paid. So I'm like, I got other things happening. I'm not going to go check on them. They're fine. But when it came to them moving out, it was a, it was a disaster. So with our cleaning crews and Airbnb, the benefit is if we have a stay for three, four days, we got the cleaning crew right there. It's like a you know hotel. Check-in is at um, 3 p.m. Check-out's at 10. So we have the housekeeper there at 10.30. And it just, the system just runs once you find the good people to plug and play. Yeah. Okay, that's awesome. And so, I, I mean, that's an interesting example. In that scenario, you said you were getting 1600 a month uh, rent on it for a long-term rental. And I just did the quick math. If someone did it for, for 30 days, you're making 5500 a month. Exactly. And that, listen, that was, at, um, that was at $180 a day. But check this out, Marcus and everyone watching. So once they book, and I could control the, 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 um, dollar amount on the platform so I, I I right now I went in and raised all the prices coming up for um you know the snowbirds October because it's it's you know the season of summer is slow but we have to take it as an annualized basis so anyway as soon as they booked this a couple months back I went on the computer because I knew that they were going to check out at the end of September so we got people booking for October at like 300 and $25 a day for that same spot just because the demand is so great in October yeah. and we already got a booking for three nights for like a thousand thousand dollars so wow yeah I'm telling uh, you I mean even in the scenario and that's particularly that scenario even if it's rented out for half the month and vacant for half the month you're still coming out farther ahead than you would uh long-term rental on that less month. headaches less headaches and it's interesting it's an educational thing because I don't know about your brokerages but i know a lot of brokers in arizona right now they're having their um realtors have open houses so i personally will go out and walk open houses just to meet realtors because that's a big way that i find my properties and a lot of them are like oh you're an airbnb isn't that like a, a lot of problems, a lot of work? And so they don't really grasp it because they just see it from the media's point. Like, oh, it's a party house. They're, they're going to get destroyed. And that's their only perspective. Yeah. So that, because that's, let's talk about that for a minute. Is, is there, who does the vetting process for the tenants or is there much of a vetting process to see who's coming? Okay, so they're called guests. So I, because I always, always call them tenants too. They're guests. Okay, guests, yeah. So, so the, the beauty of it is, you, first of all, like when you're doing a property, you ask me about location. I, I, I like to, you know, help people figure out their location, their parameters. But the big, big thing is quality. You want to make sure things are working, they're functional. 
clean. I always say, hey, just spend a little extra, throw a brand new fridge, throw a brand new uh, stove oven, microwave, because that the I've used, you know, refurbish, and those usually end up breaking like 60 days. So just put in nice stuff. If you don't have the capital, you could put it on your credit card short term. And then when the Airbnb starts making money, you pay it off. But um, yeah, that's important to have what stands out what stands out from marcus's uh airbnb to flips like if it's down to that why are they going to choose mine over marcus vice versa so make sure you have quality stand out the 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 pictures um so the, those are important what what was the exact question because I, I was Oh, I, was, I was talking about the, and I said tenant, but the guest screening of like- Oh, guest screening, great, yeah. yeah. So that, I was just, so what happens is I don't vet any of them. And I used to dread, like, cause you know, I did a lot of my own property management. So I vet them as tenants and you never know. You, It's hard based even, yeah. you know, you, you never know who's gonna have to be evicted or whatever problems come up, but- the beauty is Airbnb, as a guest, they want to get five-star ratings. As a host, we want to get five-star ratings. So we, Airbnb will um, vet them by rating them, you know, so you, you read their reviews. Do they have five stars? Do they have problems? What's going on with them? So you could pick and choose if you uh, accept the reservation or mm. not. Now, there is another uh, function on there. It's called Instabook, where Airbnb still vets them because they take like their credit card information, their personal information. But as the host, I wouldn't get to vet who I let in um, because they're on Instabook. And as soon as Airbnb allows them to book it, they could book it if it's on Instabook. Instabook mm -hmm. just means that they could book right away once airbnb does vet them with all their pertinent information and okay. other things they do I, I like that uh the idea of the the guest rating as well so they want to protect their their rating system for their next rent so that that, that does make sense yeah and what's what's the average length of a, a guest stay for it for your properties it, it really varies on location. Like I said, the one in Chandler has been very, I mean, that one, I mean, you know, man, it, it varies by season, I'd say, because the summer was, well, we actually picked them up. Yeah, so 25 days probably out of the month for that one, unless we have the 30, like the 90 day booking. And then some of them in central Phoenix have been a little slower. Um, so I have houses and then I have, um, condos and townhomes too. So, yep. you know, I'm, I'm looking Great. at all that to see where I go in the future and just running numbers. And cause I, now that I'm in it, I have to see how to maximize my investment. Like yep. the first thing I just want to get into it and then yep. how can I get the best bang for my time and my money? Yeah, and I, yeah, I'm imagining that your ROI on the ones you're converting from long-term uh, rentals to short-term rentals is significantly higher because your cost basis in those properties is significantly lower because the timing in which you bought them uh, versus something you're buying in today's market at today's price. Your, your revenue is going to be the same, but your cost to maintain that property is a little bit yes, higher. Correct. Because uh, 2012, I bought some stuff for couple of those condos were like 40,000 or something. Yeah. So, so four, four months of renting them out is paying for, paying for right, it. Right. Um, yeah. But, you know, having been in it now for a couple of years, um, there's one deal. So I want, it's not all like there are problems. So um, that it's interesting because that first Airbnb that I bought that one um got destroyed is from uh, a party from a guest and so I called Sasha I called JM and they're both like hey flip welcome to the business because <laughs> unfortunately guys it's gonna happen but like how do you mitigate it is the key and that's what we've always tried to 
to do is um, we, we are very clear in the rules, but this was a younger girl. We found out her mom lived in Paradise Valley, got her this um, townhouse. There's a bunch of parties going on. We didn't know about it, but um, the housekeeper called in tears. And so, but here, check this out. Um, it was my first go around through that. Um, Sasha guided me through it. JM helped me too. Kyle helped me. So take pictures, documentate everything. Airbnb has the reassurance policy where, you know, if, as long as you documentate and, and send them everything, they have a giant policy. They're going to take care of you. So they broke two TVs. The bill was about five grand. So they reimbursed me everything. And, um, the, you know, you have to front the money to get it back and running, but it took a little while. That was the only thing, but like they, they did reimburse wow. me. That's cool. So, I mean, that was a tough experience. The other learning experience I had was um, I accepted cash app because the, the, the person said, Hey, you know, can we save on some fees? We've been here uh, rebooking through Instagram. We want to save. So I did that and you should never do that because <laughs> again, they abused it. They broke some things. I didn't, I have insurance, but it was not that kind of claim with the deductible that I wanted to take it to the insurance company. So I paid for it in money plus a learning lesson. Like yeah. don't take cash out, <laughs> keep it on the platform. Yeah, smart. Particularly, that's cool that Airbnb has a, a bigger umbrella policy on that kind of stuff to help uh, offset some of that. Yeah. Uh, what about from a criteria standpoint, because we've all heard the horror stories over the last couple of years of someone that bought uh, an Airbnb and then the HOA came around and said, no, nope, no more nightly rentals here. Um, yeah. So what, what are you doing as part of your vetting process to make sure that that you're protected in, in doing that type of rental in that in that area? Um, so what we do, it's called the. So in the beginning, I didn't I didn't really check. I, like I said, I'm a guy that jumps in and sometimes <laughs> yeah, it, it costs you. But it, it, teaching people, I would definitely say do your due diligence. Um, there is a couple ways to do that. Um, you can look on AirDNA. Um, there's another platform I use to see if there are rentals in the complex, in the area. Um, and then you get the CCNRs when you go in under contract to, to title, to escrow, and you have to read those CCNRs. So um, some of them will say 30-day um, minimum rental. Some of them will say 90 days. Some of them won't have anything in there. Um, and if they don't, I would say, like, they could change them, I've heard. But, like, I don't know. I've been hearing wholesaling is going to be illegal for 18 years too so yeah. like you guys are going to make a lot of money doing it if they do change them you sell the property or you just turn it into a long-term rental and you're you're still going to cash flow and yeah. get the depreciation yeah um, i know that some hoas because a couple of the properties i own um the hoas come out and limited like the number of rentals in the area things like that yes. where they grandfather you in and then another one one of the properties i'm looking at right now in in florida uh, in reading the CCNRs, I was really interested in the property, but they they allow a uh, uh, nightly rental or short term rental, but then okay. they put some claimers around it where they're saying, "Well, it's got to be a minimum of thirty days, and you can only have do it three times a year." Yeah, so, and I I've heard some hosts that will play around with leases and stuff, but I you know HOAs I'm not too keen on and. So, yeah, and, and it's interesting, Marcus, because it's usually, usually the smaller ones. And what I found out is like some of the board members actually own property in that. I've had a couple of those wow. happen to me. One is Evergreen Terrace in Mesa. That one was horrendous. We, we had that place and we were, they had security cameras all over it and we did our research and they owned a large portion of the complex, but they, they were actually on the news because they were also running a property management company. So they would try to manage your unit. And if you didn't 
do that, I felt because I was doing my own management and they would be finding me like every other day. Oh, he left the toilet out front for like 30 minutes. Oh, you know, there was always, so I had thousands of dollars of these HOA fines and I was like, what the heck? And so they were just trying to force us out and buy the place. I can't remember the year, but eventually I'm like, I'll just put it on the open market. I'm not selling it to them. Uh, but it was just, you know, some HOAs when they're smaller complexes, just be aware that they watch them more versus like one that has yeah. 2000 properties. They, they rarely will bother you. Yeah. Cool. Good, good, good advice. Um, what about from a financing option? Are there any unique, uh, pieces of financing, this type of, of so product? I see your whiteboard behind you. We've done... <laughs> in the modules, and we'll talk about the course later, but we've done hundreds of hours of like whiteboard examples. I love to do the whiteboards. Um, so there's a strategy which I've been, you know, done over the last couple of years in getting my properties. So what I do is I take them down with hard money. So you know, private money at 12%. I use a guy, a couple of people in Arizona, no points, no fees. And typically they will um, ask me to put in, I think it's like 15, 10% of the purchase price. Um, so for example, we bought one at 200, we bring in 20,000, you know, 20,000 at closing, and then they get you the hard money loan for six months. Um, in that time, what we do is we renovate the property, we season it, we turn it into a short-term rental. We have all the data from uh, the Airbnb platform. We take that debt, that 12%, which it's okay short-term guys, don't get caught up in 12%. So we take that debt to a guy I met on Instagram who has a hedge fund money out of Connecticut, all the money comes. So we take that to them. We were putting, we were stabilizing the debt. I was stabilizing the debt with them. I was putting like loans at three and 4% when loans were rate great. And those are investor rates guys. And I was paying, I was paying to get them, but 30 year fixed. Um, and that's what I did with all of the short term hard money loans i just use that strategy because guess what that two hundred thousand dollar house it's similar to the burst strategy is now appraised at 315 or whatever they because they require appraisal so we actually pull some money back from time to time with these mm. so the rates have gone up but it's um based on your bank account and your credit score and then you have to prove to them that you are actually taking income on that property cool that's awesome uh, is that is that the hedge fund still uh buying notes right now oh yeah they're big um the rates i just did one the rates have gone up quite a bit um everywhere has oh yeah yeah but like the i don't even know if the fellow is the owner but literally i never like marcus and i i've never um well I think you and I talked on the phone or text or email, but like, I've never talked to Warren. The title company has never talked to him. He's all email. He's very short in his emails, but he closes every single deal. I'm like, I don't really need to talk to him or do as long as he performs. And yeah. like, he's always done what he said. And he's a large company. They promote like crazy on Instagram and they're actually real because you get a lot of fake folks on there. So yeah, that's cool. Very cool. And so I, I, I like that you've created that finance system of like, okay, we, we do it this way. We can close quick. You probably can negotiate uh, better deals if you're doing like cash quick close on that, yeah. on that type of financing. Um, cool. So one, I want to go back to the question real quickly around the management piece, because if you're going through the app for uh, Airbnb or VRBO, by the way, do you have a preference between the two or do you market on you both? No, I... <laughs> Right now, I've only done Airbnb. We did set up VRBO, but we never went active because um, I've had success with Airbnb. We could talk a little bit about the shift in Airbnb too, because I've uh, since I got in the space, I networked with a lot of the 
top um, people around the country in the space. And so the algorithm has changed quite a bit uh, the last three, four months. So basically they are boosting up experience versus like regular stays. So mm. I'm just kind of looking at my numbers and I'm thinking there's a lot of other platforms. I mean, there's this one uh, friend of mine, he has a, his um, assistant, or she's, she, she's a project manager. So she is on a lot. I forget how many platforms, but you know, the top ones are of course, Airbnb, BRBO, booking.com, um, Google now has it. So you could do some of that stuff. Um, there's also an app called Peer Space where, say, you have a, a, a beautiful area where a photographer would want to come shoot. Um, the, the couple out of Nashville I taught, they have that now set up in their property in Nashville where it's on Peer Space and the photographer pays, it's a minimum of two hours. It's like 150 bucks an hour. So there's, there's different ways you could oh, cool. get into it. Like, I never got into the peer space because I, I I didn't want to take away from my Airbnb income. But like in the summer next year, I may check that out because I'm um, we'll see how it you know pans out next year. Cool. I like that you're always evolving. I think that any business like this is you got to constantly be massaging it. I, I recently just uh, uh, put together a series that I, I called "How to C Increase Your ROI" because I feel like a lot of people over the last ten years bought properties and then have just kind of like set it on a shelf and and left it there. Where there's like very specific strategies of like, hey, there's things you could be doing along the way to increase your return on this property 100%. along the way. Be be a good steward of your money and massage and keep changing things. So good for you. I love that. Yeah, and and. I learned early on, like you're in the business, but like you're always thinking a step ahead, like evolving. What, like, yeah. what? Because things are changing. The industry changes, the market shifts. So, what are we going to do to stay ahead of the? Yeah. That's our show called actually Cut the Curve is our podcast. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Cool. That makes sense. So, how, how involved from a management standpoint are you? Because, you know, you go through the platform, Airbnb. They book, uh, the accounting happens, uh, the front end accounting happens there. But then are you doing the, the turnovers, the, the, the got a cleaning crew lined up? Like how involved are you? So that team around you makes or breaks you, right? So the cleaning crew, I use uh, that. Clean. So everything is relational. So I use the cleaner that was already in the airport my first one and the the expectations were not on the same so we sh shifted to interview another one we hired another one uh still not there where we need to be so we brought and not that we were getting bad reviews it was just we were really detailed oriented so we we have a third group now working for us and spot on i mean there are some things sometimes you you always have to check on the housekeeper not every cleaning if you're not getting anything in the reviews but we do have um where we personally go over someone on the team goes over at least once a month says so after they clean we don't tell them we just pop in there and yeah. check it so Smart. you know and we a few things have uh not they missed or something so we just you know remind them and and you know, just let them know. And it's been great. But again, like any business, you, you have to have the right people around you. Um, the second part of the team, Marcus, is the maintenance, right? So AC goes down, it's 110. You better send someone out there as quick as possible. So I, like you probably have a Rolodex of 10 companies I'll call. Oh, he can't do it, but he could do it. So you got to have your, your tradesmen yeah. in your Rolodex because speed, efficiency, when the guest is there, we got to send someone. So those two factors, I could be in Hawaii, which I was by the way, in January for like three weeks. I was in California for the whole month. That's what I'm telling you. Like it's, it, if you set up the, the, the system, like it just runs, of course, acquisition and other things and creating and renovate those things you, you do along the way, but it does allow you to travel and do some things that 
you wouldn't be able to do if you had a fix and flip business or it's just the way you want to set up your your life yeah and so you you recommend through your program that people self-manage their own uh, Airbnbs and not because I know there's some companies out there that yeah. will say we'll manage it for you. Okay, so um, there's three ways to really get into Airbnbs. So there's the ownership where you actually own the asset. You go, you close on the house, you buy it. The second way is called arbitrage, which is um, you're kind of, you're the middleman. So you're subleasing this home or this apartment it corporate lease to another individual and then the third way is to manage people's airbnbs through the platform and they they will charge quite a bit of your um your month like your 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 monthly so they i think these 20 i don't know because i've never but in the beginning a few had talked to me i think it's like 20 percent or 18 to 20 so yeah. you could do that but for me like I just everything I owned like I didn't I had the I didn't think it'd be that hard to manage especially I've managed rentals myself and the problem is um to be honest like when I had my rentals and I had property managers I didn't feel like they really were like on your like timely and on top of it like i needed it done i i need to send someone like and that's the it's a different attitude because they're not the owner so they yeah. no one's gonna take care of your place like you do so that was it for me i've always i mostly self-manage my long term and so it it's it's a good experience too because if you like solving problems like you're gonna have to get your feet wet, solve some problems and, but your income is going to be, you're going to get paid for that. Or if you don't have time and that's not for you, there's some great property managers out there. I would just say interview them and make sure it's a good fit. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, it's funny that was your experience with property management because I was the same way buying a bunch of houses and, and couldn't find a property manager I liked. And ultimately that's why I created a green management group is I needed a property management company from an investor mentality. So I do believe for most people, if, if you have the time and energy to do it yourself and at the same time, you got to scale it. Cause it, like, even for me with the number of, uh, even though I bought a significant number of properties, even me managing my own properties with that many didn't make sense. And that's why I opened up say, all right, well, yeah. let's, let's grow this thing. And, um, and yeah, I've heard a lot of owners like yourself that just, they couldn't find those quality efficient property managers so they started their own yeah it's yeah, in interesting well man this has been uh really interesting so for us to wrap up our conversations if someone wanted to get more into this space um and you were going to give them a couple specific action items to say hey here's the first couple steps to, to start putting this together what would you tell them okay so the why, why do you want to do this? What, you know, your, your reasoning behind it. So I think just journaling and figuring out being self-aware, your why, because anything new, Marcus, you and I both know starting different businesses, it's, it's scary, but you just have to jump in sometimes. So, yep. you know, um, so write down your why YouTube's a great educational platform. You could, Whatever thing you want to learn about short term, you can find on YouTube. Um, Instagram is another great one. I give away a ton of free value on my Instagram, on my YouTube. And then if you, the other big equation, um, I had Trent on the, the my podcast a couple of days ago, and he has been in the game like 20 years like us, but he shifted two and a half years ago. He does like um, large apartment wholesale deals. He, he's got a $30 million hotel wholesale he's working on. So he, he said on our show, guys, um, you're going to pay some, you're going to pay for something. So either pay for a mentor or pay for your mistakes. Like mm -hmm. it made so much sense. I'm like, just pay for a mentor. So the mentorship programs are all over the place research them check them out make sure it's a good fit um and then i would definitely get a mentor in the space join you know like a group community so we have both we have the um the modules we created which 
that's part of the membership. And then the community is amazing. We meet once a week on Zoom. All of us are in there. Um, that's a great way to get your, your question and answers. And um, so there's, there's so many ways. It's not like we were trying to, you know, find mentors <laughs> through different channels. Like there's mentors all over the place if they really want it. But again, the, the final caveat I'd say uh, Marcus, and maybe you could give me a little insight because I know you've been start around a lot of folks and stuff. So um, time frame, like when someone joins or starts something new, what, how do you work with that person? And like, because there's some expectations like Instagram, instant, we'll do it instantly. So what, what do you recommend around like starting something? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I, I think what you were saying in, in regards to ha having people really understand their why, like why are they doing it? It's because one one mentor that or, or one person that their whole why behind it is, hey, I've got money to place and I don't want to think about it. And I, but I don't want to sit in my bank account. There's a different strategy that that person should take versus the person like, hey, this is my first investment uh, that's not in my 401k. I'm nervous about it. I want to learn about it. I want to take care of that money. I want to watch it work. Like the path for that person is going to be differently. So I love that from a coaching and mentor perspective of, of going from, hey, here's the program, run it, to saying like, hey, let's better understand what are you trying to accomplish? Like what's the bigger picture? And then let's work backwards to say, if, if I know the destination you want to go, then I know the first, now I know the first step. Right, the 100%. And you may think this is crazy, but when I do the one-on-one -on -one apprenticeship program, it's like a two and a half, three hour meeting. We, we cover all that mind stuff and dump it out and, you know, those are cool. intense and uh, I, I feel you have to start there. If you really want it, it's available. So, you know, that's that's what we we uh, love to help students with, uh, you know, setting that up and, and getting it because you got to know where you're going. But do you have a context around like a time when, you know, because people start something and they may started and then like a couple months later move on to something else mm -hmm. and then oh okay. I'm just I curious that. your your experience and how you yeah so of. so the way i kind of look at that is and it's a terminology we use in our company called the 30 60 90 and for me anyone should really be able to if they're a student of something they should be able to own it not know everything about it but own the tasks own the responsibilities within 100 days and so the, and then if you break that into a, a three month period to say, okay, well, where, where should we, do, where should we be in 30 days? If we're not on track in 30 days, we're not going to be on track in hundred days. Fact. So yeah. for, for me, that's where I like to break it down and say, okay, where's my expectation for you to be in hundred days. And now let's break that down to say, okay, where would you need to be in 30 days? Where would you need to be in 60 days? And then let's make sure we're having regular conversations to say, are we on track? Are, yeah. are, and if you're not on track and not saying, Hey, you're out, it's, Hey, where are we off on track? Is it 100%? Is yeah, because you're a system, a model, right? You're on a new track. So give yourself some grace. How we, and I'm not going to beat you up, but I want you to be honest, like, because I'm not going to be able to help you if you're saying, I've done this and I, and I can tell too, right? So I know yeah. the work that they actually put in. So one of the, the things that um, we also talked about, Marcus, is uh, time. So we, we time block. So I, I give them the uh, exercise. You got 168 hours in the week. What are you doing with your time, Marcus? Go through it. Block it out. Because yeah. you need to know where your time goes is, is where you're headed too. So yeah. that's yeah. a big, big introductory when we set up the course. Yeah, I love that. I, I hear people all the time that I'm coaching talk about their goals they want to accomplish. And then I ask to see their calendar, right? And I'm like, well, you're saying you want to do that, but there's nothing on your calendar that suggest, like supports that. <laughs> that reminds me of a funny story. So uh, back in the day at my church, uh, I we used to have like social events after we go and play volleyball and stuff. So I yeah. befriended Ken, who was a painter. And Ken really, in our young mid-20s, probably Ken really wanted to get married. I'm like, 
Ken, um, how many dates have you gone on? I'm like, <laughs> I'm always a number saying, I'm like, yeah. if you do this, you're going to get this result. So yeah. like, oh, I haven't done any, asked any girls out, Flip. I'm like, Ken, just start, <laughs> you know, maybe ask three girls out this week and start somewhere, <laughs> but like, you need to know where. <laughs> that's fun. that's funny i want to get married but i don't really want to do the dating thing yeah i'm not i don't think i'll date that's funny all right so uh let's wrap this conversation up where uh where do people find you so two about two years ago we got on instagram uh flippin f-l-i-p-p-i-n underscore a-z and under in the link under the link there's a um, registration for the PIA Accelerator course. Um, if you guys want to check that out, you can register there. We have about 30 students right now. We haven't promoted it. We started about two months ago. And so there you get in the group and then you could also do the private one-on-one -on -one, uh, apprenticeship. And we started our YouTube channel, guys. And that is a compilation of my whiteboards plus our all our podcasts from Cut the Curve, where I interview mentors, moguls, and entrepreneurs. We're on number 16. Um, and the YouTube channel is called the Airbnb Climb. So please subscribe and tell me who you want to see on the podcast. Uh, and it's not all real estate, guys. It's, you know, could bring in all different smart minds. I always learn so much. Um, and then we're on Spotify, cut the curve for people wanting to listen while they're driving. So those are my two main platforms, Instagram and, and YouTube. Okay, awesome. Well, man, I've, I've uh, just really appreciated you spending some time with me today, impressed with what you're building, what you're doing. Uh, so thanks for sharing that with us. One of the one of the thoughts I had uh, as we were talking today that I thought was was interesting, and I'm going to uh, put some time in and some journaling time into this, is the idea of you had something working really well for you. You had these rental properties, long-term rentals that were were doing what you what you intended. Their intended purpose was to be used as a long-term rental, but something clicked into you to say, "I want to repurpose this asset in my world for a for a new result." And, and that makes a lot of sense from a real estate perspective. But one of the things that me personally, I want to sit back and, and think this through is beyond the real estate transaction is what are the assets in my world that, that when they came into my world, I use them for some specific purpose, but do, do they need to be repurposed? Like for example, um, maybe a coaching relationship or, or someone in my world or, or a skill that I've learned as I learned it or brought that person into my world for something specific at that time, but am I honoring that asset? Uh, for it's how I'm using it today. So that's just a thought I had yeah. while you were talking. Uh, I love it. Repurposing yeah. that property. I love it. The, again, like th not even, enough of us spend time thinking. So, and for me, I'm very, uh, I have to see it. So I'm a very big journaler, probably like yourself. And then I just reflect on it and you don't need the answer right now, but it'll come to you as long as you're seeing it, writing it down. And but I think that's that's a great idea. I'd love to hear what results and how you yeah. what happens. Yeah, cool. All right, Enchilada Nation, thank you for sharing some of your day with us today. I know your time is valuable. And by saying yes to this, I know you said no to a thousand other things you could have been doing during this time. I hope you found value in the conversation. I know that I did. Um, and I'm really excited about learning more about this. I want to hear from you about how you're uh, taking this information and implementing it into your world. And don't forget, Enchilada Nation, go live life on your terms. Take care, everybody.